don't have a higher unemployment rate and you don't have to import social aid in other countries and we need to get our kids to take those jobs. So that's kind of my one of my passions and I wanted to help the kids put it together. They kind of have a problem with love. We 
we do spend a lot of time doing the really boring stuff of uh, filling our services out, collecting money, paying rent, paying the light bill, and those kinds of things. What is the most exciting part of my job? I would say that uh, I was in corporate America for a very long time. I was in government for a little over 10 years, and I got exposed to a lot of different things. So about two years ago, I decided, what is it that I really want to do? And I wanted to start my own business and work on things that are really important to me. And the things that excite me are the things that help shape the community that we live in. I am lucky enough to get to work with the people who pay me, who develop policy initiatives, special projects, things that actually come out of the ground, um, buildings, things that actually are level to the ground, like river blocks and roads, things like that, that all impact our community. And I'm very fortunate. I would say that's probably the most exciting thing about what we do in our office. The most boring part of the job, that's easy. That's billing clients, collecting money, paying bills. Um, if you want to run a successful business, you have to bring money in and you have to put money out. And um, that, is, that is my least favorite uh, uh, part of the job. There was another question that I don't know if it was actually on there, but quality of life. Um, it, it's not a great balance in this particular profession. Um, I am lucky, or, I don't want to say lucky, there's a whole group of kids here. I don't have children. <laughs> <laughs>
they're getting involved is if you're in the financial institution business, and they're also a fiduciary for other people's money. So you have people watching over your shoulders, helping you to do some things and make those decisions. Probably the greatest program I had in my life was spent 25 years in the Central Bank of the United States called the Federal Reserve. Is anybody here that this is the Federal Reserve? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. uh, very, very fortunate. I was recruited into the bank when I was about 32 as a second ranking finance officer and then spent 25 years uh, there and left as a senior executive member of the management committee and tiny, tiny little bit involved in terms of monetary policy. But the great thing about the Federal Reserve is it creates the economic background and environment where my people can be successful in their business. You want to be an entrepreneur, you got to be able to count on a stable economy. You want to be a corporation or a city, you have to have a stable economy. That's what the Federal Reserve does. So as you can see, there's all kinds of things. Uh, money, you can make so much money if you're in Wall Street if you're successful, more than you can even remotely think about spending. Okay, and, and you're literally, you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year is not an uncommon number for a really, really successful investment banker. You know, some of you're running one of the major firms like Goldman Sachs or something like that. Then, of course, it scales down. If you're in corporate America, it pays more than, uh, than uh, being a, a public servant like being at the uh, city of Jacksonville. Uh, you are able to, like I say, uh, uh, pursue many, many, many different avenues. Background um, uh, of that, um, education, uh, strong math, math and science background is always a good thing. I happen to be a social science undergraduate that turned out uh, very, very well for me because so much of you in businesses is as to be up. And then having the technical side of it uh, with the MBA and the program. Uh, uh, worst thing about my day is that I had no idea what my day was going to be. Uh, I come in, I have this nice little calendar that's out there. And it looks like it's going to be a stable day. I can get some desk work done. And needless to say, um, the chairman of the work in the city will be able to identify with this. And it just kind of blows up just about every day. And you end up doing all kinds of different things that the chairman thought you should end up doing. So it's a fascinating field, very broad in nature, very lucrative in terms of what you can earn. Um, and I found every day, well, and most every day, very exciting and interesting. Thank you.
So it is a method of working. Uh, it was what created my position with RSH. Yeah. There was no fifth manager before uh, this technology emerged. So when you have, um, you lean towards computers and you like technology, um, make sure you focus on the BIM aspect of architecture. Uh, because as at RSNH, when we look to hire uh, a young person, that's what we're looking for. You know how to use Revit or BIM, but you're going to get in over somebody that doesn't have that experience. So your day can look uh, like a lot of different things. If you work for a large company like I do, uh, your day is very structured. You come in at 8 o'clock and you're meeting at 5 o'clock Monday through Friday. Uh, if there's a deadline looming, those hours definitely change. I'm not saying you don't work nights and weekends, but as a general rule, you're working 40 or 50 hours a week. If you decide that a large company is not for you, and you would rather get up out of bed and not have to change your clothes, technology allows us to work from home. You could very easily be a, licensed, a registered architect, work out of your house, and have your own architecture practice. It presents a whole other uh, level of challenges, of day to day challenges. Uh, when you work in a large company like RSNH, there are people whose sole job is to go out and get jobs. If you have your own practice and maybe the ones people are helping you, it's on you to go out and drive the business and develop the business and find a job for people that you know and design. So your day can look very different. Work, there are benefits of working from home. Obviously, your schedule is much more flexible. You work on your time. Uh, it may or may not be easier to, uh, to grow your family that way. If you work in a large company, it's much more structured. Um, the range of salary, you know, that, that can be a, a popular misconception uh, with architecture. Uh, there is quite a range. If you're coming out of school and you're starting out as an architect one for a company,
topic equipment, but to maintain it and make sure that it does what it's supposed to. So it used to be in the past that, uh, you know, remember the industrial revolution, Steve was kind of like a big driver. Now computers and programmable controllers or what we call PLCs are what uh, controls the machine. And so uh, a automation engineer would pretty much uh, sit down, understand the problem with the customer. For example, they may want to move uh, a particular uh, group of widgets or boxes from one place to the other. And so there's a conveying system that would have to be controlled. Well, the control has to be thought out, you know, how much does that widget weigh? You can't just, you know, launch it to one point to the other. You have to, you have, to have to move around in a controlled manner. So when we talk about automation, it's about how we allow, uh, how we interact with the system and how we use technology to make that happen. So manufacturing is the biggest area where we use uh, a lot of automation. But that doesn't just stop with manufacturing. We always uh, think about the new building, for example. Uh, you may want to you know, control lights to turn on at certain times during the day or at night, of course. Uh, you may want the uh, AC, uh, ventilation air conditioning system to change temperatures. You know, so you, every time you interact with a like thermostat, that would be considered a control. So imagine if all these controllers would have the ability to communicate and orchestrate how they behave and all these uh, activities. So automation engineers have the ability to kind of become directors or you know, to orchestrate uh, motion and control um, for, for whatever the, the challenge would be. So I mentioned a car wash, you know, if you're going to one of those automatic car wash washers, an automation controls engineer would have to sit down and understand, well, you know, I have to put certain segments around this system so that it could operate in a way that it's safe. The safety becomes the priority when you start uh, dealing with automation. So on that car wash, you have to say, well, what if the car is this big or this small? Well, the sensors will kind of measure around what the car is and determine, okay, well, I need to travel X amount of uh, feet or inches or centimeters uh, in order to safely navigate around the car and do, do the job. So uh, there's a lot of details that come into uh, when you uh, deal with automation. Uh, a day in the life would be uh, you have you know you have electrical engineers, you have uh, automation engineers, you have uh, uh, directors, different people that sit around. And a customer comes in and says, we have this particular problem, and everybody has to kind of go on the line, you know, uh, whatever path. There's a person that obviously manages the group, and they'll direct everybody else to know what, what they need uh, to, uh, to accomplish. Um, one of the, uh, if you were talking about what's the worst or the most boring aspect, I guess I, I, I always want things to happen fast, so sometimes I have to wait for the contractors and other people to kind of get their stuff done and, so that I can do mine. Uh, there's always this process of trial and error. You gotta try things, test them if everything's good, then you're victorious. If not, you just kinda have to go through that whole process. Uh, and uh, I mentioned two terms before I go. It's HMIs and PLCs. I wanted to give you an example of what HMI yeah. was. And HMI is a human machine interface. It's also a PLC that controls the machine. Yeah. And I don't know if you were able to do this one. So this is an example of an HMI. So this particular customer, we had to create an, a simulation. It was open and they were selling valves for ships. And so we created an inter interface that uh, somebody would click on a button and it would pop up this display. And then when they hit open, a valve would actually sit in, in the display, would actually open it. And then when they hit close, it would close. And then we had a little simulation that said, well, the ship is too heavy in the back or too heavy in the front. So the automation part would be that the valves would automatically open, detecting that imbalance, and move water from one side of the ship to the other just to create an internal balance. So this, this is the kind of stuff that an automation and control engineers would uh, be involved. We would have to build HMIs, which is control POCs, which is engineering control. Okay. So we'll be in the back. Anybody has questions? Should I come all over the place? So hopefully I didn't confuse you, but hopefully made it interesting for you to uh, maybe consider this as part of the uh, Thank uh -huh. 
of the signs of doctors. Some doctors will see 30, 40 patients a day. It's a grind. I can't do this. <laughs> I, I also decided that my personality, which I think is important for you to do, you have to find a job.
mine's special. I, uh, when you go work at Mayo, I have a lot of
people are getting married with all the pregnant people all the friends. And this is a married man with the reality of the world. You gotta pay the bills, but he'll talk at you or scream at you, or the children say, never listen to you. So now I'm coming to the practical side of the profession. Right? Gotta see both the sides. That's why we came together. So that we can see that these nice part of that greenery and the practical part. It's a beautiful profession, it's awesome. One thing I want to tell about this for you guys is pharmacist is not just giving pills standing behind the counter. If any pharmacy you go, if the pharmacist is standing behind the counter, tell them, please pharmacist come here, I want to talk to you. I have a good saving for you for payments also. You want to save a lot of money. Every time you go to the doctor's visit, you pay twenty five dollars, you wait for one and a half hour. Doctor comes, two minutes. Okay, thank you. This is your prescription. Bye bye. And he collects forty five dollars from you and something else from your insurance. Pharmacist is free. Who doesn't like free in your country? No one. Pharmacist can give any advice to you, any amount of time, anything you want. He can save the money. Number two, pharmacist can not only save money for you. He can save the money for your health care. He can save the time for your doctor. Instead of going to the doctor for every small thing. So that the pharmacists can fill the work they work with the doctors so that they can serve more community and more people. The nice part of the day, every day, end of the day, if I can help one customer with their health care and the health is right. The worst part of my job is I either can go free, not eat my lunch. Every time I go home, I take back my lunch. My wife gives Henry, that's what I do when I come out of the moment.
Thank you all. And then then it is ready to be released out. Everybody can go out and buy either through your doctor or from the uh, from the And then they also do this something called post approval follow, -up, just to see how it is in the market, how it's been affecting uh, everybody's life, whether it's beneficial or is there any side effects. If then then if they have a lot of side effects and the benefits, then you will see all these recalls that you hear about. And then the companies as such, okay, once the more product is out in the market, they want to stop, they think about new products, uh, and developing this new gen uh, or new generation products, again, eventually, because all of those two benefits again. So that's the key. Money is on one side, but what are we trying to do? So these are the companies, I'm sure you guys have not heard about it. You have Abbott, Electronic Red Work, you have Baxter. Of course, I love traveling. All these places you can see. 
Wednesday in Hungary, and, <laughs> and the important thing about all these is how they need to make them. So you can see this mine on the page. Okay. And is there a thing I would like? Meetings, sometimes all day long, and long hours, and the deadlines. Again, these are all coming for all the disciplines, all the jobs that you do, long hours, working hard, and you need to take calls, you need to be able all those things that we can do All right. Um, again, you need to have a basic four uh, uh, college and a lot of uh, science uh, background you need. And I think that's, that's pretty much basic science guys you need to have and a lot of experience in the field. Thank you. I'll be up. with never before imagined innovations. We are part of a world where everything is connected. A world where doctors can operate on patients in remote towns, where professionals can meet with colleagues on a different continent without ever getting on a plane, and where you can bring forward new ideas and reach millions of people, companies, and governments around the globe. This is only the beginning, and Cisco engineers are leading the transformation. Cisco engineers imagine and build the products that make the internet of everything possible for people around the world. From the earliest days of the internet, Cisco has been a force of change in connectivity and technology transformation. We're excited to explore what's next for ourselves and the world. This is your opportunity to shape the course of the future and have a positive impact on the way people live, work, play, and learn. Cisco is shaping how the internet is evolving. Join us and engineer the world of tomorrow.
year 2020, there's going to be 50,000, 50 billion devices. To, and those devices are your smartphones, they're your refrigerators, they're your cars, they're your, you name it, those devices are connected to the internet. So being in the industry for 30 years, I've seen truly the internet you know, progress from bringing in the different devices that Hey, I wanted to share email with you, so we connected a router together to do that. Then, you know, we wanted to sh share multiple devices onto a, uh, a single uh, infrastructure, so we had local area networks. Then we made them virtual area networks. And you guys are continuing to drive how technology is being consumed. It's causing a very big shift in how we do business today. Uh, we sell routers, switches, servers, telephone systems, we sell all sorts of uh, different hardware, but the way it's being consumed is what is changing, and that's what's happening with you guys. You know, you're going to be anywhere. You're going to be, you know, at the bank. You're going to be sitting in a coffee shop. You may be in your office. You're going to be using your own device. Uh, you're going to have a different need for some sort of bandwidth uh, on an application that has to be able to be uh, you know, dynamically and programming, programmatically, if I can say that word, uh, change to how the network is. The network has to have uh, intelligence to be able to talk to the applications and say, hey, this is what's going on in the network. Uh, what do I need to do? And the application turns and turns around and tells the network, well, I have these needs because I've got so many different you know, new devices and whatnot are coming on. So what that does is that opens up a whole line of different career options. You obviously have things such as security, network security, which I, I actually focus on network security. And you've seen breaches like what happened with Target, you know, all the credit cards, the uh, information that was stolen. You know, that was a very simple hack that, uh, that uh, was uh, took place on one of their wireless devices, and then they were kind of ingenious on how they got it out uh, without everybody knowing. Uh, that, that, you know, so there's, there's opportunities within uh, security, there's opportunities within programming, hardware infrastructure, uh, and maintenance and programming. So there's all sorts of things that go along with, into a, uh, a network uh, infrastructure type of opportunity. Now I'm on the sales side, I support CR. Yeah, I want to like the same like how uh, make my job. I tell him it's going to work, he makes sure that it works. <laughs> but, you know, from a career opportunity perspective, from uh, making money, uh, you know, anytime there is some sort of sales, uh, there's a there's unlimited potential for us uh, for being out there. What I like most about my job, my quality of life, is it continues to evolve. I eat my own technology. I work from the house most of the time. I have video. You know, I cover three states. I, I don't have to get out of my pajamas in the morning. I've got video. I've got you know a complete office set up. When I leave the office, I've got my smart devices. But uh, you know we really are what makes all that connectivity.
part of a, a very major overhauling that we are doing within the organization. Uh, we are converting every single branch, every single uh, bank within uh, City Bank. So, uh, that's uh, a significantly big work that we are doing right now, impacting about 200 million customers. That is something that uh, you know, I can talk about because when I jump in ahead to what I, what I'm happy of doing is something that we did, something that we do, actually touches the customer. Am I saving a life? No, I'm definitely not saving a life. But um, I'm doing something where it touches the everyday bank balance of a customer. I feel good for that. That to me is a very good thing. Um, what we're doing right now is a 1.2 billion dollar initiative. We are bringing in. Uh, a, a complete overall technology uh, within uh, uh, the organization. It's never been done before. It's never been done in any organization uh, as big as we are. We are about uh, 251,000 employees and probably equal amount of consultants working with us. Uh, I have a team here in the US, in Singapore, in London. So uh, my family knows this very well. I'm on the phone. My, my, my son thought that I just do only talk to because I, as, as he mentioned, I'm on the phone 80% of the time because I have a team uh, and I have uh, development teams in Singapore, Shanghai, India, and a whole lot of places. So it's good. It's good because you get to travel, you get to see a lot of new people, new culture, you learn a lot. I've been in my work in five countries so far. Um, my last one being Singapore, from where I innovated six months ago. So it's an it's a excellent opportunity. Technology is there everywhere. Wake up in the morning, from the time your alarm goes off, the time you go to bed, there is IT everything. Right? To the point that you made, from the lights that are there here, to almost every other uh, specialist and mentor who's come here today, they touch and feel technology. So I'm glad that not only we are a part of a silo here, we are also on the floor. We touch everybody. Maybe the smartphones and iPhones and the apps that uh, all you young boys and girls who use there, they're all something that some developer somewhere in some part of the world uh, had developed. So we, we are seeing you in a different way, um, not in person, but definitely in a different way than as much as uh, my other mentors here have seen. That's okay. Um, what I don't, uh, what I like about the job I mentioned to you, it's uh, definitely something that you're uh, able to see the impact of the customers, the bank balances. What I don't like about this is it's very stressful. Uh, typical day, 6 o'clock, sometimes 5 in the morning, goes on until probably 11, what is that? Uh, probably about 11 p.m., not 11 a.m., 11 p.m. Uh, so it's kind of a crazy thing, uh, but I love it. It's great, uh, and you will enjoy it too, because when you see something being developed, it's your day to day, when you see that being used, and somebody so, there's a plus and minus, as I said earlier, right? Enjoy what you do. If your passion is to do something unique, do something which is, you know, well um, in touch and feel, that's wonderful. Typically, um, you do a four degree, obviously. If you like math and science, this is your field you can choose. Because there's a lot of focus on math and science for India. It's estimated by 2020, and this is a closing comment that you all need to know, that uh, there'll be more uh, on the final part. 1.4 million jobs more needed, people will be needing, uh, than what people are going to actually get. So there's a lot of potential here. Uh, make good use of it, do the right thing, enjoy what you do. Thank you.
that's all that I do because I can't kill everyone here. <laughs> um, yeah, so when people hear my title, they, uh, I'm a senior intelligence uh, officer, but I'm really an analyst. Um, I'm not actually an officer, I'm a civilian. Okay, there's two things in law enforcement. There's sworn people and civilian people. Sworn people are the ones that are going to go kick in door and carry guns. Civilian people that help them, support them, do their things. So I have a civilian, always have been a civilian. Um, I'm going to be talking about crime and intelligence analysis. Okay, there are two names, they're kind of the same thing. Current, modern, vernacular, they're merging together. The skill sets aren't that different. Now there's all kinds of specialties. If you become a crime analyst in a police department or in an intelligence agency, CIA, okay, in DC there's a million jobs. Okay, and the average fan is a lot higher in DC. But um, so if you're gonna go into the crime analysis world, you, know, you could be supporting monitoring, you could be supporting robbery, uh, you could be detectives, you could be supporting the administration and how to how to lower and reduce crime through strategies working with the community. Okay, it's not just catch the bad guy. I think most people think when they just catch the bad guy, you do that stuff. Okay, that's what happens. Uh, a lot of stuff happens in Jacksonville, thankfully. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty decent city, but there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on. You might hear of Shelton Bell, bringing a name from a year, about a year, a couple years ago. Okay, Shelton Bell. Shelton Bell was graduated from Temple High School. He was making bombs in his apartment. He was trying to go over to uh, the Middle East to train to become a terrorist and come back and do serious damage. And animals were a big part of catching them, okay, and, and cutting them up. Okay, it, it, people don't realize there's been probably 170 plots since 2009. Okay, terror running plots. You don't hear about a lot of them. Okay, because they catch them very early on. Okay, they catch, you know, catch them very early on. But terrorism is one, just one little niche. If you have analysts that deal with all the exciting stuff, a lot of the really bad tech crime doesn't happen in high volume, okay? So in, in, in my current role, I used to run crime intelligence analysis for the Jackson Sheriff's Office. There's about 20 analysts. Okay, it's important to think about it. That's 20 jobs. Not a ton of jobs in any one city, okay? But there are a lot of jobs across the country, okay? There are literally thousands of law enforcement agencies, including little towns that might have one analyst, okay? So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, it's a growing field. When I first came to Jacksonville to manage crime analysis for the sheriff's office, I came to Charlotte. I, ran, uh, I was a management analyst, a crime analyst in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. When I came down here, we had I started with five, and when I left that shop, you know, ten years ago, we were up to twenty. Okay, and they still like to grow it. The recession, with the recession, they haven't been able to grow obviously. But right now, I manage a U.S. Coast Guard intel analyst, a um, two Florida Department of Law Enforcement intelligence analyst. Uh, some of the sheriff's office and some of a couple others. What I do is very regional, okay? So we're doing regional stuff. Now, I don't help Duval County with stuff in Duval County. I help Duval County know that the same guy is doing things in other cities and towns. Okay, so that's what I'm doing and what I do now. And of course, we're looking for suspicious activity that could be terrorist as part of our role at the Asian Center. So that's the kind of stuff I'm doing. Uh, one thing about this job is it's, it's endlessly interesting, okay? This is a job you're not going to get well kept, probably. I know a lot of analysts who have that quality because you learn a lot of stuff, you have specialized expertise. It's a blend of technology and crime. It's social science, really, social science. Okay? That's where it's a blend of, okay? And when you know this stuff, you can make a lot of money, especially if you go private later. I have friends who have developed software, okay? And are doing very well, okay? Because they sell that back to the intelligence community, they sell it back to the police department, okay? So there are things you can do like that. Uh, but you don't take the job back. You take the job because it's interesting to you. Um, and I always tell analysts that, that we hire or that, that we're committed, if you don't enjoy this job, you need to find another. Because this should be a very fun and interesting job. Because you have all the excitement and other things, so you can save up. <laughs> hey, let the police go to all that. <laughs> so so you, you, you really should enjoy it. Um, so I'll tell a, a cut, I think it's more fun to tell a couple quick stories. I can talk about the dry stuff in the hallway, what kind of classes, database stuff, all the tools, geographic information systems. Uh, all the things that we tend to use and how it's changing. The social media and all this networks that we're talking about, okay, data is growing so fast and we're the ones that have to take that data and try to figure out something from it. Okay, so Jacksonville gets 2,000 calls, I'm sorry, just a million calls per service a year in Jacksonville. You think I can sit and read those reports? Those up calls? No, it's all data. So uh, a couple quick, last quick story I'll tell. Um, two. Uh, one is you've got an analyst, okay? You've got some ATMs all over the, all over the, all the city, okay? You have to find data on ATMs, not easy to do. The ATM data doesn't tell you if they're in a strip mall or not. Analysts have to use mapping systems to fit and look at these different things and say, okay, just trying to figure out where this person's going to hit next, okay? So then you have to use aerial photography to figure out is this in a strip mall? 
The sales notices, there's always woods behind them. Okay? Each strip mall that got hit was different than the others because there were no woods behind them. Then they checked call logs, and there were calls for service to that place in the day before. What were they doing? They were testing to see how long the police took to get there. So the analyst waited, 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 saw where there was this kind of situation. A call came in and said, within 24 hours, that's going to be placed against it. And that's how the police officer called. Okay? So that's what catch the bad guy story. And I can tell you stories about reducing crime, strategies that have nothing with arresting anyone. And they're the best strategies. Because if, as an analyst, you come up with a strategy where you drop crime by 50% of the neighborhood, and the officers have to make 25% less arrests, that saves taxpayers money. We don't want to put people in jail. You can't, you can't arrest your way out of problem. Okay? So that's the best kind of solution, even though everybody gets excited about the adjusted <laughs> Thank
Which means I gotta change my lens.